Over the last year or so, I've been attempting to play through each generation of Pokemon using the exact team that Ash Ketchum used in every major battle. Across the different regions, there have been varying degrees of success, but now that we've reached Galar, there is a problem. Pokemon Journeys isn't a series based solely in Galar, which largely follows the pattern of the games. Yes, Ash is still there, and yes, he's catching new Pokemon, but they're not all from the Galar region, and he's not competing in the Gym Challenge. So, this left me with two choices for this video. I could have played through Pokemon Sword with the team he's currently using, which features Dragonite, Gengar, and Lucario, or I could do a deep dive into his teams from each region to determine what team he would have used in a conventional run through Galar. As you can probably tell from the title, I chose the latter. So, in a world where Pokemon Journeys was written as a paint-by-numbers Pokemon series set entirely in the Galar region, what team would Ash have used? Well, let's start with Pikachu. Throughout his adventures, the Electric Mouse has been Ash Ketchum's one and only mainstay. They've travelled across the Pokemon world together, and as a result, Ash has never used another Electric type. That allows us to cross out a few potential team members. Ash won't be using Yamper, Pinkurchin, Morpeko, Toxel, or the two-part Electric Fossil Pokemon. The reason I'm only mentioning Pokemon introduced in Generation 8 is because that's really how Ash tends to choose his teams. Other than Apom, he hasn't ever really caught a Pokemon native to a previous region unless it's going to evolve into something new. Even Apom eventually evolved under Dawn's ownership and became a new Pokemon in the Sinnoh region. So, we're sticking to Galar Pokemon when putting together Ash's new team. Next up, we need to look at starter Pokemon. In every single region he's visited, Ash has caught at least one of the starters available to new trainers. In Hoenn and Kalos, he had just one. In Sinnoh and Alola, he nabbed two. And across Kanto, Johto, and Unova, he owned all three. The other thing to look at here is patterns within his starter captures. In six regions out of seven, Ash has caught the native grass starter, only missing out on Chespin. Half of that number never evolved, staying in their original form, Bayleaf got one evolution while Torterra and Sceptile eventually reached their final stage. Another thing to note is that on the two occasions when Ash has only caught one starter, that Pokemon has reached its final stage. Water starters are his least favourite, only owning four and somehow managing to get just one past its first stage. Ash's Squirtle, Totodile and Oshawott never evolved. For fire starters, the story is quite the opposite. Charizard, Infernape, and Incineroar all reached their final stage, with Pignite and even Quilava eventually evolving at least once. So, where does that leave us? Well, with a bit more digging to do. The easiest place to start here is with the early flying type. Aside from Alola, where Ash had Rowlet to take care of his air-based issues, the Pokemon protagonist has caught the quote-unquote Route 1 Flyer in every single region. On top of that, they've all reached their final form. Pidgeot, Noctowl, Swellow, Staraptor, Unpheasant, and Talonflame were all part of his team at least briefly. As a result, we've got one pretty obvious addition in Corviknight. Steel was one of the types that I should never used until Alola, but Meltan was a start, so it's no longer completely off limits. The three typings that Ash has still never touched are Psychic, Ghost, and Fairy, which I won't be changing here. That rules out another host of potential Pokemon and takes us into the final bit of narrowing down. Bear with me here. The only types to feature in every Ash Ketchum team are Electric, Flying, and Fire. Water and Grass have been represented in six out of the seven regions, with Normal and Fighting falling one short of that mark. The Normal types were pretty often just the Flying types though, so it doesn't really count. On top of that, of Ash's seven Grass types, only Livani wasn't a starter Pokemon, and even then, Livani was really more Bug than Grass. To round out our typing talk, Ground, Dragon, Dark, and Bug have each been represented in three regions, with Poison, Rock, and Ice finding their way into two. Steel is the only type represented just once, but we're going to change that. Okay, I've gone into enough detail on all the digging, let's get into the actual challenge. I'm not going to go through the whole team right now, but I'll explain the logic behind each new Pokemon as we add them. As I've spent like an hour on the intro, we're going to go through the rules real quick. As is virtually always the case, we'll be on a set battle style, and we won't be using items in battle. As we're trying to mimic the anime here, that includes held items, unless I mention otherwise. Okay, let's do this. Ash arrives in the Gala region with just his Pikachu, as is tradition. Crossing the border into a new region has reset the electric types level to 5, but he hasn't forgotten the moves he's learned. Last time we saw Pikachu, he knew Quick Attack, Thunderbolt, Iron Tail, and Electro Web, so that's where his moveset's starting off. Ash's journey through Galar begins in the small town of Wedgehurst, where he briefly meets Professor Magnolia and the region's champion, Leon. 
After setting up a meeting for later, Ash sees a flying type on Route 1 and you just know he's gonna try to catch it. Using the Pokedex on his Rotom phone, Ash learns that the Pokemon is called Rookity and sends out Pikachu for a battle. I feel like I already explained this one, but basically, Ash always catches a flying type when he reaches a new region. It's typically the generic early option, so Rookity fits the bill. There's actually only one other flying type Galar Pokemon, and it's Cramorant, who doesn't really seem like an Ash Ketchum team member. Anyway, a couple of quick attacks sufficiently damage Rookity to allow Ash to catch it, taking his team to two. Later, during his meeting with Leon, Ash is introduced to Hop, the champion's brother, as well as the three Galar starter Pokemon. Leon is there to gift his brother one of the starters, but the grass type Grookey takes a liking to Ash instead. When he tries to leave, the chimp Pokemon attempts to follow him, and Leon tells Ash that it's for the best. So, before we've even really gotten going, Ash's team is at three. The logic behind Grookey is fairly simple too. Ash has caught six out of the seven grass type starters, with five of those being the first starter he obtained in their respective regions. We won't be evolving Grookey at all though. Half of Ash's grass starters never reach their second stage, and as I don't think Thwacky and Rillaboom quite fit in, this seems to make sense. Having seen Ash and Pikachu in action, Leon endorses the Pokemon protagonist so he can participate in the Galar Gym Challenge. The champion then tells him to head for Turfield, and as this is a paint by numbers Pokemon series, I'm sure he picks up two friends along the way. They're probably called April and Ollie. Let's say April's dream is to be an announcer for Galar's many major stadium events and wants to travel with a gym challenger to see some big battles up close. Ollie is the son of a ball guy, desperate to get out of the shadow of his father's massive head. Anyway, they aren't important at all. Once in Turfield, Ash heads straight for the gym where he selects the duo of Rookity and Grookey for his battle with Milo. By this point, the flying type knows Peck, Leer, Fury Attack, and Pluck, while Grookey's moveset's made up of Scratch, Growl, Screech, and Razor Leaf. With his two new Pokemon prepped and ready for battle, Ash walks out onto a Galar Gym pitch for the first time. Ash hasn't received a Dynamax ban just yet, so he'll be at a distinct disadvantage, but as always, he's confident in his Pokemon. The battle begins with Ash's Grookey taking on Milo's Gossifleur, and after a quick back and forth, the Grass Starter picks up the win with a Scratch. Feeling he's already up against it, Milo decides to Dynamax his Eldegoss right away. A Max Overgrowth blasts Grookey, and even though it's not very effective, it's enough to level up the match. Rookity enters the battle second for Ash, but Pluck isn't quite enough to finish off Eldegoss, so Max Overgrowth knocks her out too. So, like in Kanto, Sinnoh, and Kalos, Ash has lost in his first gym battle. During a training battle prior to his rematch with Milo though, Ash's Rookity evolves, so when he returns to the Turfield gym, it'll be with a Corvusquire. The start of the second Ash vs Milo battle plays out very similarly to the first. After Grookey knocks out Gossifleur, he's defeated by the Dynamax Eldegoss, taking the battle into a 1v1. This time around though, Corvusquire is the one facing off against Milo's ace. Ash calls for Pluck, and the flying type outspeeds Eldegoss to strike first. It's a solid first blow landed, but the Dynamax Pokemon counters with a max overgrowth. Even though it's resisted, it deals some serious damage to Corvusquire. Luckily, she's still able to attack first, and another Pluck knocks off Eldegoss to earn Ash the win. Despite lacking a Dynamax Band, Ash has triumphed against Milo, earning the Grass Badge to begin his Galar journey. On his way to Hullbury in the next Galar gym, Ash encounters a Galarian Farfetch'd on Route 5 and attempts to catch the Fighting type for his team. In Pokemon Journeys, Ash caught a Galarian Farfetch'd for himself, and unlike Dragonite, Gengar, and Lucario, I actually think this one makes sense. Fighting types have made it into Ash's Kanto, Johto, Sinnoh, Unova, and Kalos team, so it's clearly one of his favourite options. Regional forms don't really count as new Pokemon to some, but like Apom and Gligar before it, Farfetch'd is really being caught with its new evolution in mind. Anyway, Ash battles it with Pikachu and then Corvusquire after the Electric type is defeated. Eventually, Ash makes the catch, taking his team to four just before he reaches Hullbury. Holding the leak is sort of Galarian Farfetch's whole thing, so she will have a held item unlike the rest of the team. Although Grookey is holding an Everstone just to eliminate the chances of me accidentally evolving it. Farfetch'd only knows Brutal Swing and Fury Cutter when Ash catches it, two moves that his anime version has used in Pokemon Journeys. Alright, let's move on. As soon as Ash reaches the coastal town of Hullbury, he heads for the local stadium. That's where his next gym battle awaits, so it's all that's on his mind as he reaches the seaside town. For his battle with the gym leader Nessa, Ash selects the trio of Farfetch'd, Grookey, and Pikachu. Their movesets are unchanged from the last time you saw them, so we don't really need to go through that. 
The battle begins with Nessa's Goldeen facing off against Ash's Farfetch'd, and although the water type lands the first hit with Horn Attack, the fighting type gets the better of the opening exchange. A critical hit on Brutal Swing tosses the fish backwards, taking her below half health. The two Pokemon then repeat the attacks from the first turn, leaving Farfetch'd weak and Goldeen unconscious to give Ash the lead. Nessa calls on her Aracuda next, and once more her Pokemon strikes first, this time with a priority Aqua Jet. Although Farfetch survives the hit, after another Brutal Swing, Aracuda attacks again to tie things up. Pikachu replaces the defeated Likachu, and even though Aqua Jet connects for a third time, the Electric Mouse quickly regains the lead for Ash with a Thunderbolt. That takes Nessa down to her final Pokemon, so with her last throw of the dice, she sends out Dreadnought and instantly activates his Dynamax form. Ash is still without a Dynamax band though, so he'll have to take down the gigantic Pokemon with just his regular team members. Pikachu's Thunderbolt definitely leaves a serious mark, but Dreadnought's Max Strike is just too much for the Electric type to take. The Dynamax move decimates Pikachu, leaving Ash with only his Grookey. The starter's ability transforms the battle into a grassy terrain, as Nessa wastes no time in calling for Max Darkness. Grookey's blown back by the power of the Dynamax move, but he returns to his feet to counter with a Razor Leaf. The leaves whistle through the air, soaring into Dreadnought, causing massive damage to knock off the Dynamax Pokemon and hand Ash another win. That victory earns Ash the Water Badge to take his total to two and bring him one step closer to the Galar League's Champion Cup. Okay, let's keep going. On his return to Motostoke, Ash crosses paths with Leon once again. After realizing that Ash has won two badges without the use of Dynamaxing, the champion gifts Ash a Dynamax band of his own. Once he's explained how it works, he bids Ash farewell and leaves. At this point, Ollie probably has a deep conversation with his father, the Motostoke Stadium ball guy, and then it's time for another Ash gym battle. Against Kabu, Ash selects the trio of Corvus Squire, Farfetch'd, and Pikachu. The flying type is at level 26, but her moveset's unchanged from last time. Farfetch'd is also at level 26, and she's added Detect and Retaliate to Brutal Swing and Fury Cutter. One level higher at 27, Ash's Pikachu still has Quick Attack, Thunderbolt, Iron Tail, and Electro Web on hand. So with that covered, let's get into the battle. Kabu sends out his Ninetales to start the battle as Ash calls on Pikachu, activating his Dynamax form for the first time. Unlike in Pokemon Journeys, Pikachu can't just Gigantamax right off the bat as I'm not sure that really makes sense. Instead, it's just a regular Dynamax Pikachu for the time being. After two strikes of Max Lightning, Ninetales goes down, having only mustered a single Fire Spin. Arcanine's called on next, and he's hit by another Max Lightning, which ends Pikachu's time as a Dynamax Pokemon. The attack takes Arcanine to his limit though, which means one quick attack's easily enough to finish him off. With two of his Pokemon down, Kabu sends out his Gigantamax Centiscorch to attempt to turn the tide. Although Pikachu's able to slow him down with an Electro Web, Centiscorch's Max Flutterby finally gets Kabu off the mark. Ash replaces Pikachu with Farfetch'd, and the fighting types retaliate further damages the Gigantamax Pokemon. A G-Max Centiferno is just too much for Farfetch'd to take though. The Gigantamax move annihilates Farfetch'd in a single blow, leaving Ash with only one Pokemon remaining. Corvusquire enters the battle last and starts by attacking with Pluck. The super effective move is a critical hit that almost knocks out Centiscorch, but he lives the hit and counters with another Centiferno. Along with the damage from the fire spin it creates, the Raging Fire leaves Corvusquire on the brink of fainting too. That sent to scorch his last turn in its Gigantamax form though, and with that advantage gone, Corvusquire is able to land one final attack for the win. Kabu falls to his knees in defeat before accepting Ash's victory and handing over the Fire Badge. With the Grass, Water, and Fire Badges now earned, Ash can travel across the wild area to Hammerlock and beyond, where further gym battles await. On the long road to Hammerlock, Ash meets a Score Bunny who's been abandoned by a completely evil trainer, as is tradition. Ash's fire starters tend to have been abused by awful trainers along the way, so this makes sense. Charmander, Chimchar, and Tepig were all treated awfully by their trainers, while Litten's past was also seemingly tragic. So it makes sense that Scorbunny was probably also mistreated by a complete bastard. Oh god damn it! That's a different E2, I think. Anyway, Ash has a pattern with his fire type starters that explains the choice to include Scorbunny. It seems to go two on, one off. So, Kanto and Johto, yes. Hoenn, no. Sinnoh and Unova, yes. Kalos, no. We've already had the yes from Alola, so let's add one for Galar to keep the pattern going. When Scorbunny agrees to join Ash on his journey, it knows the moves Quick Attack, Double Kick, and Flame Charge. Its growth has been stunted by its previous trainer, but unlike Grookey, we will be evolving Scorbunny in time. Like I said earlier, Ash's fire starters have always evolved at least once, so there's no reason to change that now. 
On the road from Hammerlock to Stow on Side, Ash's Farfetch'd is pushed to its limits in a fierce battle and lands several critical hits, causing it to evolve. This feels like the right time for this evolution to happen. In Pokemon Journeys, Ash's Galarian Farfetch'd evolved after around 30 episodes, so a little over two gyms worth of time seems about right. It's also around here that Ash encounters Hop once more and the two have a battle to test their levels. It's really only notable for Hop's Cramorant attempting to take down Ash's Pikachu by spitting a random wild Pikachu at it. I'd love to see its strategy for taking down a Waylord. Anyway, that takes us to Stone Side where Ash's fourth gym battle will take place. Let's say it's here that April has to commentate on her first major event when the regular Stone Side announcer calls in sick on the day. We're now up to a 4 on 4 battle for the gym, so Ash selects the team of Corvusquire, Scorebunny, Surfetched, and Pikachu for his face off with B. Other than leveling up, there haven't been any major changes. Corvusquire learned Drill Peck during some training, and Scorebunny added Bounce to its arsenal, but despite evolving, Surfetched has an unchanged moveset, as does Pikachu. Alright, let's get into the battle. Ash's Corvusquire and B's hit on top open the battle, attacking with Drill Peck and Revenge, respectively. As it's a super effective attack going up against a not very effective attack, Corvusquire deals far more damage. As a result, the second Drill Peck finishes off Hitmontop to give Ash an early lead. B sends out her Pangoro next, and Corvusquire gets the matchup going with a Drill Peck yet again. Pangoro's countering Night Slash isn't enough for a knockout, but when Corvusquire dive bombs for another Drill Peck, Bullet Punch stops her in her tracks. Pangoro's massive fist collides with the flyer, knocking her out to level up the match. Ash calls on his newly evolved Surfetch second, so let's all appreciate the most beautiful move in any Pokemon game. Fighting for her fallen friend, Surfetch attacks with Retaliate, slicing through Pangoro to score a cinematic knockout for Ash. That's when B sends out her own Surfetch to see which of the two is stronger. Although it seems like a stalemate at first thanks to Detect, the mirrored Pokemon eventually connect with some moves. A critical hit on Retaliate almost earns the win for Ash's Surfetch, but instead it's Bees who scores the finishing blow with Revenge. Third in line for Ash, Scorebunny leaps onto the field for its first gym battle experience. Although Bee attempts to prevent an attack by calling for Detect, Scorebunny manages to avoid the barrier by leaping into the air with Bounce. By the time the Fire Starter hurdles back towards the ground, Surfetch's Detect has failed, allowing a clean strike. That knockout leaves B in a 1 on 2, taking her down to just her Machamp, who she immediately gigantamaxes. Ash switches Scorebunny for Pikachu as the fighting type grows, but a max strike quickly puts an end to his involvement. One shot from the Gigantamax Machamp blows Pikachu away to quickly take the battle into a 1 on 1. Scorebunny returns to the field, and in a final effort to claw the battle back, Ash decides to Dynamax a Pokemon other than Pikachu for the very first time. Scorebunny explodes in size and outspeeds Machamp to attack with a max airstream that almost takes the giant fighter off her feet. When the retaliatory max strike falls short of the knockout, Scorebunny is able to send another max airstream crashing into Machamp. This time around, it's just enough to take her down, earning Ash another impressive victory. As the battle comes to a close and Ash and Scorebunny celebrate, the fire type begins to glow bright and evolve. In an incredible debut performance, the win over Machamp was enough to cause Scorebunny to evolve into Raboot. B thanks Ash for a great battle and then hands over the fighting badge to take Ash's total to 4. Then it's time to move on. Ash and friends head through the Glimwood Tangle to Balanlee where the next gym lies. For his battle with the fairy type gym leader Opal, Ash selects the team of Raboot, Pikachu, Grookey and Surfetched. After taking a liking to him, she seems to be testing Ash to see if he's a suitable option to take over her gym when she retires. Without her focus totally on the win, Ash makes fairly quick work of her. Raboot burns up her Galarian Weezing with a Flame Charge, knocks Togekiss out of the air with a Double Edge, and then uses another Flame Charge to take down Mawile. Opal's Gigantamaxed Alchemy manages to defeat Grookey and Surfetched before her time runs out, but once she's reverted to regular size, she's no match for Pikachu. Iron Tail finishes her off to hand dash the win, and thanks to another fantastic performance, a further evolution for his Fire Starter. Raboot becomes Cinderace, learning Pyro Ball in the process. Then Opal hands over the fairy badge and sends Ash on his way. While heading back through Stoan's side, Ash and friends meet a scientist named Phoenix. She's researching Pokemon fossils in the Gala region and has recently restored a Dracovish. In order to learn as much as possible, she asks Ash to take the water type with him to use in battle. As Dracovish has taken a liking to Ash, it's a no-brainer, so with that, we've made it to six. Like Surfetch, Dracovish is another Gala Pokemon that Ash has actually caught in Pokemon Journeys. This one also made sense to me. In recent seasons, Dragon has gone from a type that Ash never used to one that he rarely misses. 
From Sinnoh to Alola, Ash has used four different dragon types, so adding another feels right. The reason I skipped over the Sobble line is that Ash's pattern with water starters is two on two off, so seeing as we've just missed out in Alola, we're due another region off. Anyway, Dracovish knows Scald, Bite, Ancient Power, and Dragon Breath when Ash adds it to his team, so we've got a well-rounded moveset to work with here. This is one of those lengthy stretches without a gym battle, so before reaching Sir Chester, Corvusquire evolves while saving Pikachu from Team Rocket. Probably. In hindsight, I maybe went a gym early on this evolution, but it'll be fine. This also marks our final evolution, completing Ash's team. This is a pretty powerful group, but that's sort of the way things have been skewing in recent regions. Which completely makes sense. The more Ash progresses, the better his teams become. As far as base stat totals go, this is still a long way short of either his Kalos or Alola teams. Alright, to get back to Corviknight, she learns Steelwing upon evolving and finally forgets Fury Attack. That's everything we need to cover before getting into the Surchester gym battle, so let's meet Gordy. For the 6th Galar gym battle, Ash chooses to use the team of Grookey, Surfetched, Corviknight, and Dracovish, leaving Pikachu and Cinderace on the sidelines. The only move changes since you last saw the team are that Grookey's learned Woodhammer and Surfetched has learned Brick Break, so with that, let's get into the battle. Gordy sends out Barbarical to start things off as Ash calls on Grookey. The grass starter begins by firing a razor leaf at Barbarical, and as he's quad weak, it deals some serious damage. By beginning with Shell Smash though, Barbarical ups his speed enough to strike next with a powerful razor shell. So many razors and shells happening here. Grookey just about lives through the shell variety razor to counter with a second razor leaf and pick up the first win of the match. Gordy sends his Shuckle into battle next as Ash switches out to Surfetched, and we can skip the bulk of this. In the end, a Brick Break cuts down the Rock type to extend Ash's lead to two. Third in line for Gordy is his Stone Journer, and for some reason he starts by calling for Wonder Room. That flips the Rock type's base 135 defense and base 20 special defense stats to really soften him up for the incoming Brick Break. It decimates the almost defenseless Pokemon, taking Gordy down to just his Colossal. Of course, he activates its Gigantamax form as soon as it enters the battle and just hopes that'll be enough to come through a one on four. Two blasts of Max Flare do succeed in knocking out Corviknight, but already Colossal's down to just one remaining Gigantamax turn. Dracovish is outlast for Ash, but G-Max Volcalith isn't enough to knock out the fossil Pokemon, so Colossal reverts to its regular form with three of Ash's Pokemon still standing. Ultimately, it only takes one, as after a few turns, Dracovish Scald knocks out Colossal to hand Ash another gym battle victory. Gordy parts ways with the Rock Badge, leaving only two empty slots in Ash's badge ring thing. After spending some time in Snowy Surchester, Ash and friends head for Spikemuth next, where the Galar region's only non-stadium gym is located. There's also no power spot in Spikemuth, so there's nothing to facilitate Dynamaxing, but Ash has proven during his last two gym battles that it's not something that he needs. Instead, it's just a regular 4-on-4 four -four battle to determine who's best. In their first face-off, Ash and the local gym leader Piers both find themselves down to one Pokemon. Although Cinderace manages to knock out Skuntank with a double kick, the ability Aftermath means both Pokemon faint simultaneously, and as a result, Ash doesn't receive a gym badge. When he returns for a rematch, Ash better understands how Piers battles. After sending out Grookey to start, Ash quickly makes a switch out to Surfetch who attacks with Brick Break. She scores a critical hit knockout at the first time of asking, giving Ash a nice early lead. When Piers sends out his Malamar, Ash recalls Surfetch and calls on Grookey once more. Once it's done slamming Malamar with a wood hammer though, Grookey's hit by Payback and it's too much for the grass starter to take. Ash returns Grookey to its Pokeball and then replaces him with Dracovish, who quickly gets revenge for its fallen comrade. Scald finishes off Malamar, but once again when Piers sends out his Pokemon, Ash makes a switch. Cinderace and Obstagoon take the field with the Fire-type transforming to fighting thanks to its ability as it attacks with Double Kick. That comes up a little short of the knockout, allowing Obstagoon to counter with, well, counter. It throws Cinderace back across the battlefield, but it also comes up a little shy. Another double kick leaves Obstagoon unconscious, so only Skuntank remains for Piers now, while Ash still has three Pokemon available. Knowing the risks that come with battling Skuntank now, Ash prepares by calling for Surfetch to use its newly learned sword stance twice before calling for Retaliate. Sometimes you just have to sit back and appreciate beauty, and we will be doing that every time Retaliate is used. Thanks to the massive attack boost, Surfetched one-shot Skuntank and has enough health remaining to live through Aftermath. That victory earns Ash the Dark Badge, meaning there's only one left to collect before he qualifies for the Champion Cup. 
On his way back to Hammerlock, Ash meets up with Leon once again. Upon learning that he's won seven badges, the Galar Champion tells Ash that Rayhan's on a different level to the rest. Having kept a close eye on Ash and Pikachu during their Galar journey, Leon recommends that they travel to the Isle of Armor to train and see if they can access Pikachu's Gigantamax form. So, Ash and friends head for the Isle of Armor where they spend their days exploring and training. They meet Mustard and Honey, who, even for Pokemon characters, have exceptionally dumb names. This is probably like a 15 episode arc at the end of which Pikachu has learned how to use its Gigantamax form. So the electric type will now have access to G-Max Volt Crash when it's Gigantamaxed. Upon returning to the mainland, Ash heads straight for the Hammerlock Gym to challenge Raihan. For the final Galar Gym battle, Ash needs four Pokemon and they'll be facing Raihan's team in the double battle format. Selecting the team of Pikachu, Corviknight, Cinderace and Dracovish, Ash readies himself for his toughest battle yet. The Hammerlock Gym Leader gets things going with Flygon and Gigalith as Ash sends out Pikachu and Corviknight. Before any of the Pokemon present can launch an attack, Gigalith's ability causes a powerful sandstorm to kick up. After all the training they've done together, Ash decides to start by recalling Pikachu and allowing it to Gigantamax. They are quickly brought down to Earth when Flygon strikes Pikachu with a breaking swipe, but the close contact results in static, leaving the dragon paralyzed. Pikachu then fires off a move in its Gigantamax form for the very first time. The Max Steel Spike that ripples through the field to collide with Flygon actually doesn't cause that much damage though. It's not until Corviknight's Brave Bird lands that Flygon's knocked out of the air. Ash calls for his Pokemon to repeat their move, so they run it back with a Max Steel Spike and a Brave Bird combining to finish off Flygon and hand Ash the lead. Raihan sends out his Sandaconda in place of Flygon, but it's another ground type, so Pikachu really isn't able to make full use of his G-Max Volt Crash just yet. Instead, Ash calls for another Max Steel Spike, this time aimed at Gigalith. Even as a super effective move though, it doesn't make a massive impact. Sadly, before even reverting to normal size, Pikachu's knocked out by an Earth Power from Sandaconda, so it's all square. Ash sends out Dracovish to replace Pikachu, who joins April and Ollie on the sidelines. The fossil Pokemon almost gets off to the perfect start, just failing to defeat Sandaconda with Scald. The move does leave the ground type burnt though, so he responds in kind by paralyzing Dracovish with Glare. That's Sandaconda's last action though, as the burn chips away his last sliver of health, leaving Raihan with only two. Gigantamax Duraliodon takes the field, towering high above the rest and gets started by sending a Max Rockfall crashing down on Dracovish. You know what they say though, a rockfall a day keeps the fossils at play. That is to say, Dracovish lives the hit and scalds Gigalith into unconsciousness. Ouch. Even though Raihan's Gigantamax Pokemon is still in the battle, Ash is now at a massive advantage with his opponent forced into a one on two. After the sandstorm subsides, the whole crowd realizes that the battle's been happening this whole time and is almost over and that they paid thousands of dollars to watch the world's worst Darude concert. Unlike Pikachu, Duraliodon succeeds in using its G-Max move, but like Volt Crash, Depletion's a pretty disappointing name. They'll never live up to Butterfree and its G-Max befuddle. Weirdly, G-Max moves aren't only judged by their names though, so Depletion is still enough to take down Dracovish. Cinderace enters the battle loss for Ash, and is badly injured by that Gigalith stealth rock that I completely failed to mention earlier. For some reason, Raihan wastes Duraliodon's final Gigantamax turn by instructing him to attack Corviknight with Max Knuckle. As the skyscraper shrinks down, the size of the task in front of the Hammerlock Gym Leader only grows. Cinderace casually showboats for a minute before kicking a pyro ball straight at Duraliodon, knocking him out and ending the battle. As the crowd pull out their phones to check on the terms for a refund, Raihan hands Ash the Dragon Badge, filling up the last slot on his badge coin thing. That automatically qualifies Ash for the semi-final stage of the Galar Champion Cup, meaning his next stop is Winden. As he crests the hill and stares down at the most populous city in the region, Ash gets a call from Phoenix who tells him that she's made a breakthrough in her research. Unfortunately, she needs to examine Dracovish's progress to confirm some of her findings. Ash is more than happy to send Dracovish back to its original owner for a bit, so heading into the Champion Cup, he only has five Pokemon on hand. That's all he'll need for the semi-finals though, so he's all good for now. Alright, there's only really one important battle left in the game, so let's quickly go over the intervening battles and events. Ash draws Marnie in the first round of the Champion Cup. The two have crossed paths a few times throughout their journeys across Galar and even battled once or twice before. She is the younger sister of the Spike with Gym Leader Piers, and although she's strong, her Gigantamax Grimmsnarl is no match for Ash's Gigantamax Pikachu. 
After that victory, there's only one more battle to determine which gym challenge entrant could compete in the Galar Cup Finals. Ash defeats Hop in a close matchup, meaning he gets to bear witness to Leon posing in the Wyndon Stadium lobby. Following that, there's a massive overreaction to Leon being late for dinner, which results in total chaos. It comes to a head with a G-Max Volt Crash electrifying Oleana's Gigantamax Garbodor atop Rose Tower. I don't really feel like we need to explore this one too much. Let's just move on. In the finals of the Galar Champion Cup, the victorious Gym Challenge entrant gets to face off against the region's non-Opal Gym Leaders in a single elimination tournament. Ash's draw sees him facing the Hullbury Gym Leader Nessa in the quarterfinal, the Stoneside Gym Leader B in the semis, and the Hammerlock Gym Leader Raihan in the final. After defeating them all and receiving Dracovish back from Phoenix, Ash takes the field against Leon, but Rose interrupts them with his potentially world-ending scheme. So, after a quick detour to wipe the floor with the Macrocosmos president, Ash returns to Wyndon Stadium to take on the reigning Galar champion, Leon. By now, Surfetch has reached level 62, and her moveset's made up of Final Gambit, Brick Break, Sword Stance, and Retaliate. Also at 62, Ash's Grookey still knows Scratch for some reason. The Grass Starter has actually been really solid in this run, but to keep this video from being 3 hours long, I feel like most of his highlights have been cut. Next up, Dracovish is at level 63 and now knows Ficious Rend, Crunch, Ancient Power, and Dragon Breath. For what it's worth, I'm fairly certain Ficious Rend is stolen straight from a Harry Potter character. If I'm not mistaken, Ficious Rend was the Hufflepuff Seeker when Harry first got to Hogwarts. That's a cool little bit of trivia. At level 64, Corviknight's moveset remains unchanged. She's working with Drill Peck, Swagger, Steelwing, and Brave Bird. Also at 64, and also featuring an untouched moveset, we've got Cinderace. The fully evolved Firestarter still has Double Edge, Double Kick, Pyro Ball, and Bounce. Last but not least, Ash's Pikachu is at level 65, and he's equipped with Quick Attack, Thunderbolt, Steelwing, and Electroweb. That's it, that is Ash's team for his Champion Cup final face-off with Leon. The two head to the center of the Winden Stadium pitch, go over the rules in place for the match, and then take 10 paces back because it's time to do, 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 do. you get the point, it's time to duel. Leon begins by summoning Aegislash in defense mode as Ash sends out his Cinderace. Clearly the Sword and Shield's defense points aren't sufficient as a single Pyro Ball knocks him out in one. Leon monologues, presumably about not losing any life points, and then replaces Aegislash with Haxorus. Ash also makes a swap recalling Cinderace to send out Corviknight. That move proves to be prudent as the flyer dodges a Haxorus Earthquake and then the two begin a fairly tedious back and forth. Outrage and Drill Peck land repeatedly until Leon's back's against the wall and he's forced to use a full restore. Even with that cheap strategy, Haxorus can't get the better of Corviknight though. The Raven Pokemon has almost nothing left in the tank by the time it lands the finishing blow. As a result, when Dragapult enters the battle, a single Thunderbolt is easily enough to reduce Ash's lead to one. Dracovish replaces Corviknight for the challenger, but when Ash and Leon both call for Dragon Breath, it's Dragapult who attacks first. That knocks Dracovish back and leaves it paralyzed, so when it attempts its Dragon Breath, it can't even move. That allows Dragapult to fire another Dragon Breath at the motionless fossil Pokemon, knocking it out to tie up the match. Ash is worried that the momentum is beginning to shift, so sends Cinderace back into battle and calls for bounce. Libero changes the Firestarter's type to Flying, which the champion predicts, countering with a Thunderbolt that badly weakens him. It's not enough for the knockout though, so another bounce finally knocks off Dragapult and puts Ash back in control. Then everything goes from bad to worse for Leon. His Mr. Rhyme has barely felt the grasp beneath his feet when a Pyro Ball totally decimates him. It feels like things maybe could return to normal as Inteleon enters, but Cinderace is just on something different. Double Edge rips through Inteleon, knocking him out in a single blow to take Leon down to one. The champion's final Pokemon is his Charizard, who he Gigantamaxes on entry, and just to give him a chance, Ash decides to let Cinderace knock himself out with a Double Edge. For some reason, Grookey then enters the battle. I feel like Ash has weird amounts of confidence in his unevolved starter Pokemon, so this felt about right. Shockingly, the 92 foot tall flying fire monster manages to get the better of the 10 pound grass monkey. It was close though. Ash finally sends out Pikachu next, and to even things up, he uses his Dynamax band to activate his Gigantamax form. Rather confusingly, Leon goes for a Max Overgrowth, which Pikachu happily takes before countering with the G-Max Volt Crash. Charizard is left paralyzed and on the brink of fainting by Pikachu's special move. Now unable to maintain his Gigantamax form, the champion's ace shrinks back down and with no way to defend himself, takes another G-Max Volt Crash. Pikachonk has defeated Charizard and in doing so, won the battle for Ash. So, there you have it. 
Ash could definitely become the Galar Champion with this theoretical team if Pokemon Journeys was a regular series. What was this video about again? I did originally start this run with the planned team of Pikachu, Corviknight, Inteleon, Flapple, Karkle, and Clobopus, but the more I thought about it, the less sense Inteleon made to me. I think, and this is going to sound weird, but I think Inteleon is too tall. If Ash is gonna fully evolve a starter, it's probably gonna be kinda short. The only fully evolved starters that Ash has had that were over 5'7 were Torterra and Incineroar. Torterra's only that tall because there's a tree on his back, so that doesn't count, and Ash never even used Incineroar. His Tauracat literally evolved, passed out, and that was it. There's a reason for that. Ash is famously insecure about his height. Anyway, Inteleon's six foot three, so I couldn't make it work. That was the original team idea though, just in case you were wondering. If you sat through all of this video, including that part, then I'm sorry this took so long. Nevertheless, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.